Okay, so we now have our uh, our keynote speaker, who is Professor Aiki Ikahaimo. I hope I pronounced it correctly. If not, I'm sorry. Uh, he is Professor of Philosophy at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. He founded the Australian Hegel Society together with Giovanna Luciano and Simon Lumsden. He's also a founding member of the editorial board of the Journal of Social Ontology, as well as of the International Social Ontology Society. Uh, his re research areas include Hegel, German idealism, theories of recognition, intersubjectivity, subjectivity, personhood, the human life form, social ontology, critical social philosophy, and applied philosophy. He has been working a lot on, on the topic of recognition. Uh, we should mention at least the book uh, Anarchenum from 2014, as well as the ed edited books uh, Recognition and Ambivalence, Handbuch Anarchenum, Recognition and Social Ontology, and Recognition, his new book, Recognition and the Human Life Form Beyond Identity and Difference. And today's uh, presentation is titled uh, Humanism, Dehumaniza De Dehumanization, and Social Critique. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Well, it's, it's really good to be here. Is this sound good? Uh, how does this sound? Yeah, it sounds good. All oh, good. Yeah, yeah. So it's really, really great to be in this uh, in this conference. I think one of the things, one of the few good things that's come out of the COVID thing is that we are able to have <clears throat> conferences like this between continents. Now, uh, currently, uh, the uh, though travel from Australia is allowed, there isn't much in terms of uh, travel funding, etc. So it's pretty difficult for Australian uh, academics to get <clears throat> out of this country physically. So it's really good that uh, there are conferences like this. And I'm really, really, uh, really happy uh, that uh, Giovanna and others are really bringing Hegelians uh, together across continents. Giovanna was really, really uh, had a had a founding role, very important role in, in getting the Australian Hegel Society going a few years ago and has been very, very active in, in bringing people together. It's really, really great work. And thanks for all the other organizers as well. As well. My uh, topic has changed slightly. Uh, I was going to talk about dehumanization, but uh, ended up talking about something slightly different, which might actually be more uh, fitting uh, for this conference i'm going to share my screen uh, can you see the screen now good yeah <clears throat> I'm, i don't have a, a powerpoint i just have a, a paper uh, i'm going to show the paper to you maybe it's a bit uh, easier to follow it uh, the topic might be fitting to the global nature of, of this uh, conference i'm namely going to talk about uh, how to uh, apply uh, or utilize Hegel and critical social thought in uh, the time and the place where we are living uh, in, which I uh, consider as a global space. I mean, Hegel uh, could think of himself as located in a particular place, uh, in particular historical time in, uh, in Prussia, et cetera. Et cetera. Lots of uh, recent Frankfurt School critical theorizing uh, is satisfied in basically addressing the given uh, social and political and institutional uh, circumstances uh, of the theorist uh, him or herself, though I think there is a bit of movement from that towards a more <clears throat> global approach. Uh, so I'm going to talk, first of all, kind of give you a very broad brush. All of this is going to be very broad brush, hand waving uh, genre uh, not, with uh, no footnotes and no textual references. I'm going to start with a kind of broad brush, hand waving, uh, side analysis of the time uh, which we are living, or the change of the time that we're living through, and the coming uh, realities, social, global, social realities. And after that, I'm going to talk about briefly how I see uh, that is relevant for how we are likely to be reading Hegel, uh, Hegel uh, soon, and the way that we should be reading Hegel soon. And then I'm going to end with. Uh, 
three principles for globalized social critical Hegelism: how to uh, apply or how apply Hegel or some basic ideas from Hegel for uh, a social critical approach uh, that is applicable uh, ideally anywhere uh, on the planet that we live, not only in Germany or uh, in Sao Paulo, in Padova or Sydney, but also in uh, uh, Port Moresby uh, and uh, uh, Finnish Lapland, uh, for instance. Uh, probably won't uh, do very well with that, but that's the uh, that's the goal anyway. Okay, so I'll just begin. Uh, uh, the times they are changing, and the changing of times always affects the ways we read the classics of philosophy. This is especially true of Hegel, whose philosophy is so closely bound up with the changing of times, <laughs> both by being originally a conscious response to the social, political, and existential needs arising from the changes that were taking place in Hegel's lifetime, and also by influencing changes that took place after Hegel's death. Each era will read Hegel from the point of view of the concerns and saliences prevalent in that era. Uh, what we are currently witnessing is a major shift of concerns and saliences, and it's no surprise if this will cause a shift in the reception of Hegel, a shift which, if I'm right, is in fact already underway. The shift in concerns and saliences that I have in mind <clears throat> has <clears throat> at least two components, which uh, independently might have had some different consequences, but which taking place simultaneously create a certain cultural and mental constellation which differs I think quite radically from the one that preceded it <clears throat> and which together are pushing Hegel reception to a direction one might call perhaps anthropological or humanist. To speak Hegelian, one component in the shift of concerns and saliences concerns the way we look at relations constitutive of the realm of spirit or kind of inner uh, spiritual affairs and relations, whereas the other concerns our view of the relationship, be relationship between that realm and the realm of nature. <clears throat> In the inner spiritual front, front, the previous shift lamented by many from social imagination and thought, guided by the broadly Marxist concerns of economic injustice, etc., to questions of identity uh, has been in reversal uh, since the global financial crisis in 2008. Though there's the ways in which Marxist and identity political approaches are being amalgamated in contemporary social and political thought, those, though most would agree that any rejuvenated Marxism has to take on board lessons from the debates on and theorizing about identity. The general balance of interest, it seems to me, is shifting from politics of identity and different towards broadly Marxist concerns. Capitalism is back as a serious topic of discussion in the mainstream rather than just the margins. Uh, there's a widespread awakening also to the dark sides of demands and political identity, some, uh, something that many warned us uh, about uh, many decade or decades ago already, and the phrases for, for instance. The other component of the shift I'm talking about concerns the relationship of humanity to nature or the nature-spirit relation to speak Hegelian. There's a long arch of human evolution from a struggle of immediate survival in and with uh, external nature through increasing domestication of and mastery over it to the vanishingly brief period of cer in certain parts of the planet where significant parts of the population have been able to forget or push out of their minds the fact that the origin of the food on the tables is not in the supermarket, <clears throat> that the water in the taps depends on environmental conditions that, that are not a given and that the consumer goods arriving on their doorsteps are a condensation of a mind-bogglingly complex system, a system that extracts huge amounts of natural resources and emits uh, huge amounts of pollution back to nature, and which in the long, not so long run is highly likely to collapse due to its utter dependence on natural conditions that are now changing because of the pressures from that very system. With wildfires raging at our, around the planet in 2019-20, with a zoonotic uh, spillover causing a global pandemic in uh, 2020, which shut down social life to various degrees for two years in the lands of the lux luxurious forgetfulness, and with a major war starting in Europe in uh, 2022, uh, which may be only a prelude to coming wars over dwindling natural resources, that forget forgetfulness has now ended with a rude awakening. What I'm suggesting is that these developments together and the shifting concerns and saliences that they create are inevitably affecting the def default assumptions which make particular perspectives to Hegel more and others less appealing. 
I see at least three such general perspectives or sets of premises through which it has felt natural for many to read and utilize Hegel in recent decades, and which are now on the retreat of giving way to new approaches. The, uh, these are in no particular order. Kantian constructivism or subjectivism, historism or cultural relativism, and uh, to borrow Rahel Yaki, maybe some others, the ethical abstinence of uh, liberal political thought. Start with the <clears throat> first mention. The default plausibility of the Kantian uh, transcendental framework has been a somewhat suppressed bone of contention in the concerned parts of the academia, <clears throat> some finding the basic Kantian uh, tenets, uh, that a Newtonian causal determinism about the empirical world, including ourselves, the transcendental subject, the subjectivity of time and space and of the intelligibility of the world, etc., as complete non-starters, <clears throat> while others being much more sanguine <clears throat> about them. What I'm interested here uh, is not engaging in the endless and convoluted debates about these issues. I'm rather suggesting not to put too fine a point on it, that the idea of the empirical world as an ordered whole being a creation or pro projection of a transcendental subject if it sounds much less appealing by default when that world is raging around us in uh, apocalyptic walls of flames, when it is threatening to bury, bury our homes under ocean waves, or when it is heating our cities unlivably hot, than it may sound in times when the pressures of the empirical world are less immediately threatening. That's not a philosophical uh, philosophical claim that's just a kind of empirical uh, observation or analysis of the times. I would argue that pretty much the same is true of the related Kantian idea of freedom as autonomy or self-legislation to the extent that it is understood as instituting a spiritual world spinning uh, without friction, to borrow the famous expression by Mike Dowell, from natural determinations. Again, not uh, going into philosophical finities, in light of the sign, science of the times, this idea rhymes uncomfortably with the forgetfulness of fantasy or of abstract freedom from nature, in which the fabulously privileged section of humanity has had the luxury of living for the brief period, which is now ending, I think. It is becoming overwhelmingly clear, or so it seems to me at least, that thinking of the world of objective spirit as a sui generis realm normatively isolated from a natural realm, a socialized or an historized version of the Kantian transcendental image, is simply not the framework on which it is healthy to base our thinking about human civilization. And I do mean healthy in the literal sense of physical health, well-being, and survival. Hegel never ceased to emphasize the potentially destructive or de deadly practical consequences of the concept of abstract freedom. Uh, and this construal of autonomy, let us be clear about it, is a version of abstract freedom. As for historicism uh, or cultural relativism, <clears throat> with the return of capitalism with its alleged universal laws and with issues of economic justice and injustice, again, gaining some of the ground recently occupied by ethnic, sexual and other issues of identity in political agendas and theoretical imaginations, <clears throat> and with the mentioned dramatic awakening to the universal fact of humanity's dependence on nature, it is inevitably becoming again respectable and critical social thought to focus on determinations of human life that hold for all human societies and individuals independently of historical and cultural differences. The cultural and historical uh, epochs uh, differ in myriads of, myriads of ways from each other, None of them can avoid certain universal constitutive factors or features of human life, including but not limited to dependence on favorable environmental conditions and successful metabolic process, uh, processes with them. We can always focus on particular features that distinguish particular cultures or historical epochs or particular human societies or life worlds, and thus on differentiating identities. Or then one can focus on de determinants and features that hold for all of them. It is, I believe, safe to say that given the changing of times that we are living through, the, the latter focus is rapidly gaining in, in attention and respectability. Given, uh, given this shift in constellation, it is perhaps, not, uh, perhaps unsurprising that philosophical anthropology is experiencing a rehabilitation as an academic field of inquiry to be taken seriously. It is also fit ontology, which inquires into the ontological deep structures of all human societies or forms of human coexistence, has in the last few years experienced a rapid growth into an, a very active subfield of contemporary philosophy. 
it is not difficult, I think, to see that the shifting constellation is exerting pressures, uh, pressure also on the popularity of the so closely related ethical <coughs> abstinence of liberal political thought, or the idea that uh, the liberal uh, state should be neutral with regard to conceptions of the <coughs> good or good life, and <coughs> more importantly, that show, so should social and political thought, as there simply are numerous reasonable views and no common measure which, with which the philosopher or theorist could adjudicate, adjudicate between them. Any other uh, of adjudication, so the liberal political radio would merely mean one particular view masquerading as universal. But if all human life has determinations that are not through and through historical or cultural variable, then surely this has implications also concerning what makes collective life, at least in important respects, better or worse, or successful or unsuccessful. unsuccessful. In particular, the idea that life is better the more autonomous it is in the abstract sense of free from determinations by determination by nature is clearly problematic. If it is true that determination by nature <clears throat> is an in inescapable, inescapable condition, to the extent that we consciously or unconsciously, explicitly or implicitly build our institutions and systems uh, on that view of the good life, we are building it on uh, a dangerous illusion. And to the extent that our philosophical imaginary and theorizing is premised on that view, it is contributing to the illusion and to the danger. Now, <clears throat> returning to matters inner spiritual, uh, a related danger stems, uh, I su suggest, from theorizing that overemphasizes what distinguishes human cultures and their views of the good or their normative orders. Today, <clears throat> such difference magnifying theorizing is gladly co-opted by cynical political forces for rejecting any outside criticism by an appeal, appeal to an alleged incommensurability com of evaluative or normative worldviews. Such theory uh, theorizing unwittingly lends support to the dangerous to dangerous uh, us versus them thinking projections uh, of clashes of civilization uh, civilizations irreconcilable by discursive means and somewhere down the line at worst dehumanization of them which opens the, the floodgates for the worst atrocities human humanity is capable of Whereas this sort of slippery slope critique might have perhaps sounded a bit cheap in uh, the more peaceful times that we are now leaving, I fear it may sound less so in the era towards we, which we are now possibly or probably heading. To the extent that our political discourses, institutions and systems are premised on the idea uh, of irreconcilable, uh, irreconcilable evaluative and normative worldviews, they are helpless when things start going seriously wrong between nation, uh, nations and cultures. Given where we are likely to be heading, it is, I want to argue, of utmost importance to focus on theory also on what unites all human societies, cultures, epochs, and individuals, or in short, to lend respectability and philosophical articulation to the idea of common humanity. Part of the rehabilitated uh, universalism vitally needed today is developing theoretical perspectives to what makes human life better or worse in any human societies and cultures, and thereby creating discursive means for conversation and mutual understanding across geographic, cultural, religious, and other divides. Now, what does what I've said so far then mean for the future of Hegel reception? The answer uh, I, I'm suggesting uh, is simple. Kantian constructivism or subjectivism, historical uh, and cultural relativism, and the liberal ethical abstinence will be losing at least some of their attractiveness as default assumptions under which uh, aspects of Hegel's uh, work appear as interesting and interpretations or accommodations of it as respectable, plausible, or worthy of serious consideration and debate. This holds in different ways and to different degrees, both for scholarly work on Hegel and for critical social and political thought that scans his work for resources and inspirations. Uh, inspiration, the two strands of Hegel reception, which are not always easy bedfellows, but which unavoidably influence uh, each other. What then is gaining a ground previously occupied by the said, said assumptions, for sure not universally shared among the more scholarly minded students of Hegel, but certainly widely shared by those with the more utilitarian approach. In short, <clears throat> I suggest a rehabilitated realism, a rehabilitated universalism, and a rehabilitation of an urgent interest in philosophical means for uh, evaluating better and worse forms of human life across cultural differences, or more exactly, for creating uh, theoretically plausible tools for, for such work. I mean, philosophers are not judges, but they, they can produce uh, tools. 
a clear indicator of this shift already being on the way, uh, I think, is the recent marked growth uh, in interest in a scholarly work on two parts of Hegel's uh, system that until recently have drawn remarkably little attention, the philosophy of nature and the philosophy of subjective spirit. What is worth noting here is that whereas the text, uh, text that in recent decades drew a major por portion of the attention, the 1807 Phenomenology of Spirit and the 1821 Philosophy of Right uh, lent themselves fairly easily to broadly historist or relativist readings, with the former uh, appearing to be a story of radically different, uh, differing conceptual schemes, and the latter containing the often cited passage about philosophy being its own time comprehended in thoughts. Uh, Historist or, or relatives reading face much harder time to find a foothold in the philosophies of nature and subjective spirit. Also, whereas the phenomenon of spirit has inspired readings <clears throat> according to which it accounts uh, of uh, its account of historically changing conceptual schemes presents a historicized transcendental philosophy of some sorts. There is, uh, I believe, no suggestion that uh, the the most fundamental structures of the empirical world, say mechanism, space and time, chemism, or the theology of living beings were somehow according to Hegel subject to the ebbs and flows of human history, or that they were a creation of a transcendental subject or human culture projected on something that may or may not have any structure on sich, or at least not unless one understands spirit or geist to stand for some sort of transcendental subject or subjectivity, which as I shall try to convince you shortly, is a misleading interpretation. And uh, related to the previous talk, there's much more to say, of course, about space and time in Hegel. I mean, Hegel does have an account of subjective uh, space and time as well, but, um, but uh, I'll just leave those complications now out. Uh, now, importantly, Hegel's realism about the empirical world is intimately connected to what one might call his realism about freedom. And this is where we are finally entering issues of direct relevance to the themes of this conference. Namely, what does all of this mean for Hegelian or Hegel-inspired critical theory or critical social uh, philosophy? Let me present three basic principles that in my view are crucial to grasp for a properly Hegelian critical social philosophy that is fit for purpose in the new crisis-ridden planetary order or disorder towards, towards which we seem to be heading. I have dealt with each of the three at more length elsewhere, so here my intention is merely to pull together some of the threads and paint a broader, uh, broader uh, picture. The three principles that I have in mind are, uh, first of all, the multiplicity of levels of conceptual abstraction, and secondly, uh, realism about freedom, and thirdly, uh, the recording of constitution of all human life as what I call a fundamental ethics of the human, human life form. Starting with the uh, first one, let me pose a question. Is Hegel's social and political philosophy bound up with a particular historical and cultural context, merely its own time comprehended uh, in thoughts as Hegel's memorable uh, phrase puts it in the philosophy of right, or does it have some claim for universal validity? The simple answer is both and. In fact, not always thematized clearly enough about Hegel's real philosophy, though obvious when one mentions it, uh, is that uh, it is a mixture of different levels of conceptual abstraction and thus different degrees of claimed universality. The principle is simple enough to grasp in principle, though not easy for the reader to follow in practice, uh, and certainly in no way easy for Hegel himself to exercise it, uh, as exercising it consists of philosophical handiwork without clear rules to follow and with innumerable phenomena and factors to take into account. To take an example from the philosophy of nature, think of a, de think of a descending scale of universality or necessity starting, starting from the concepts of the logic, the deduction of which proceeds purely immanently through conceptual structures such as causality or teleology that are already applied logic to the basic principles of biological life, such as homeostasis, the umwelt or niche constructions. The, uh, these are not Hegel's terms, but uh, all issues that Hegel deals with. Um, all the way to concepts in operation in Hegel's descriptions of the minute details of the life processes and structures of this or that genus of animals. What we have here is a scale of conceptual abstraction or concreteness or a priori, a posteriori or necessity, contingency, 
uh, where at one end of the scale the philosopher can do all the work simply by exercising what is the proper job description of philosophers as philosophers, namely uh, by reflective thinking. And we at the opposite end, she is thoroughly dependent on empirical knowledge produced by the special sciences, organizing and some, sometimes adjudicating such knowledge by means of the more abstract concepts. Whereas at one level, uh, whereas, whereas what at one end conceptual perspective it does not apply in principle, at the other end it does uh, so necessarily. There is no absolute description of any concrete thing, not to mention something as complex uh, as a living being, but descriptions that are always descriptions from some perspective in terms of uh, not only of the abstract logical concept of structure, but equally of empirical concepts of various levels of concreteness that develop or change as scientific theories and knowledge of the given phenomena develop or change. Now, how does this basic principle of Hegel's real philosophy then apply in the philosophy of spirit, that is in Hegel's account of the human world, or as I like to put it, of the human life form? This is where we meet the question of historicism or cultural relativism versus universalism. A question that Hegel scholars have written a lot about uh, concerns the role of the logic uh, in the philosophy of right, or in other words, the role of the a priori in principle, a historical concept of the logic in Hegel's account of the ideal state, given the historical and cultural circumstances of early 19th century Prussia. There's no need for critical theorists or critical social and political philosophers to delve too deep into the many scholarly details here, but only to know the general point. Hegel's social and political philosophy is a mix of conceptualities of different levels of abstractness, so that whereas at the concrete end we have things that are obviously only Hegel's own and time, uh, own time and place comprehended in thoughts, and hence uh, sometimes of merely historical interest for us today, often quite embarrassing. One can easily move upwards on the scale of abstraction, or if you want downwards on the scale and find principles and ideas that are less bound up with the historical and cultural constellation of Hegel's time and place and the concerns and saliences occupying his mind there. It, also, it is also important to note the, that the mix ratio, so to say, of historically specific concepts and considerations on the one hand <clears throat> and concepts that claim more in terms of universality on the other hand by no means remains constant within the philosophy of spirit. There is a significant and fairly obvious difference in this regard between its first two sections, subjective spirit and objective spirit. The relationship between these is surprisingly poorly studied, but it's clear that in terms of their content, they are internally and dialectically related, with subjective spirit discussing the human individual and objective spirit, the human society or the social and institutional world, as to speak in con contemporary lingo. The biological organism that is the embodiment of the human individual person discussed in the anthropology section of subjective spirit, the basic structures of theoretical and practical intentionality that are the topic of its phenomenology section, and the basic structures of theoretical and practical cognition, erkenntnis, the topic of the uh, psychology section, are not subject to historical change and cultural variability to the same degree, at least at all to the same degree as, say, forms of government are or at least if the latter are thought of in abstraction from the relatively unchanging constitution of human beings. Now, this uh, proviso at the end of the last ten sentence is not insignificant for the simple reason. All human societies are societies of humans, and the limits of human variability limit the historical and cultural variability of societies. The mutual or dialectical determination of objective spirit and subjective spirit is something the, that extreme forms of social constructism forget, imagining object spirit as a free floating sphere spinning without friction uh, from our ontological constitution as, uh, as human beings. Object spirit or the social and institutional world is not abstractly free from nature, including the natural side of our constitution, nor is it abstractly free from the basic structures or specifically human intentionality and cognition. Now, if we are looking for principles, concepts or ideas applicable in contemporary social uh, political philosophy that aims to speak across cultural and other differences, that aims to address a truly global audience, contrasted both with Hegel's Prussian audience uh, and the merely European or Western audience of much contemporary Hegelian critical theory, this is where we'll we will start finding something interesting. Uh, 
Namely, there is a fundamental principle often mentioned in Hegelian discourses, yet surprisingly poorly studied and elaborated on in detail, despite of the fact that for Hegel it is, according to the introduction to the philosophy of spirit, the principle of the philosophy of spirit as a whole. But more than that, it is according to Hegel, the very concept or essence of spirit itself, or in other words, the evaluative essence or immanent ontological ideal on, of, or norm of all things spiritual. This principle, evaluative essence or immanent ideal is of course freedom. Importantly, however, it is not freedom in the sense of autonomy as collective self-legislation as the Kantianizing Hegel interpretations uh, might suggest. Rather, it is what Hegel calls concrete freedom. And okay. Now, to comprehend what Hegel uh, has in mind here, we need to ad abandon thinking of freedom as or residing in or establishing a transcendental realm, where in, whether in the strict Kantian sense or in the historicized uh, sense of collective self legislation. Uh, or to be more exact concerning the latter version, we need to bring collective self legislation down to earth, put it in its proper context as an activity exercised by concrete living human beings who as living beings are bound by evaluative or normative principles that they have not legislated, that they cannot subject to legislative re review, so to say, or re-legislate their way out of. These constitutive principles or norms or laws that are our principles, but not principles legislated by us, a theme recently emphasized also by Thomas Kura Kurana, can be ultimately boiled, <coughs> boiled down to one, that is concrete freedom. It is not any old freedom, no freedom in the sense of self-legislation, but concrete freedom, which according to the introduction of the philosophy of spirit is the essence or concept of spirit. Now, what does this mean? The key here uh, is constitutive relationality, or if you want the doctrine of internal relations. Any finite thing is constitutive related to otherness. Hence the concept of abstract freedom is according to Hegel, self-destructive uh, if applied to anything to which we are constitutively related and by which we are thereby constitutively de determined. Why can be free, say, from particular other people, but not other people in general, because relations to other people are constitutive of being a human person. Also, one can in principle be uh, free from bad institutions, but not institutions in general, because they too are constitutive of our being. Similarly, one can be free from, say, overweight or bad habits, but not the animal body uh, and its habituation in general, because a habituated embodiment is constitutive of the kinds of beings that we are. Finally, one can be free from particular natural environments, but not from external nature in general. Human beings and human societies are constitutively dependent on it. What is concrete freedom then? In short, and some of these formulations are very familiar to everyone, it is reconciliation with constitutive otherness, be these other human social institutions or internal and external nature. It is the unity of unity and difference with them, or being with oneself in them in their otherness. As for the dimensions of uh, internal and external nature, uh, Hegel uh, discusses the concrete uh, free relation with regard to internal nature in some detail towards the end of the anthropology uh, section. Uh, there, the theme is uh, the, the inculturation or appropriation of the body and thereby uh, the coming about of organized embodied subjectivity, habit, the theme of habit having a central role in this. What Hegel is talking about here is the development of a concretely free relation with one's animal body. The body both has genuine otherness to me, and at the same time, its proper organization is whereby I exist as an organized concrete subjectivity. I cannot be abstractly free from it or control it without limits, the follies of asceticism uh, or transhumanism, etc. Nor can I allow its otherness to be unruly, hostile, or reduced to mere animality. These deviations from the constitutive norm or immanent ideal of concrete freedom, the essence of spirit, with regard to inner nature are destructive, potentially lethal to me as a concrete uh, subject or a human person, that is. What I need in order to flourish as an embodied subject with the human form is a unity of unity uh, and difference with my body, that is, being with myself in it while at the same time acknowledging its otherness, doing justice, so to say, uh, to it by taking adequate care of it according to the principles or norms governing it, norms that are constitutive norms for humans, yet not legislated by humans. 
The same basic principle, the concrete freedom as the normative or evaluative essence of spirit applies to the constitutive relationship of spirit that is of humans, human societies and human culture to external nature. It both has genuine externality to an independence of us and is constitutive us, of us. Much of the writing about the nature-spirit relationship in Hegel remains extremely abstract, arguably often somewhat, uh, and arguably some often somewhat uninteresting for anyone but the nerdiest of the Hegel nerds, and I confess myself <clears throat> having a nerdy streak as well. The main reason for this is that it is extremely difficult to catch in the shorthand format of uh, Hegel's encyclopedia something as infinitely complex as the relation of spirit to nature. This would be easier if spirit actually stood for uh, a transcendental subject or subjectivity or for mind or the space of reason or some such relatively clearly demarcated theme. But if one only glances the list of contents of the philosophy of spirit, it should be clear that it stands for something much more concrete and complex than that. The general best term, uh, the best general term I can think of for what the philosophy of spirit as a whole is about is indeed the human life form. What is the relationship of that to nature? Well, the answer largely depends on what more precisely one is talking about. Does one have in mind to talk, to talk still at, the, at a high level of ab abstraction, theoretical or epistemic aspects of re the relationship or, the, or practical aspects of the relationship? Does one mean, say, the relationship uh, uh, of the concepts or categories of logic or, or philosophical comprehension of them to nature, or say the relationship of Hegel's working slave to the field he is plowing? Or does one mean perhaps the relationship of the natural sciences to nature, or perhaps the metabolic exchange of a village or a city or, uh, or nation or humanity as a whole with its natural environment? All of these are instantiations of the nature-spirit relationship, and thus talking about that relation in general can be a somewhat fall-on exercise. Hence, whatever one makes of the few austere sentences Hegel uh, formulates in his philosophical shorthand about this relationship, they should always be interpreted with the richness and complexity of what spirit and also nature actually stands for, uh, to have that in mind in interpreting those austere sentences. And yet, whichever particular instantiation or aspect of this uh, ask axis of, constitu of our constitutive relationality, the relation to external nature, one has in mind exactly the same immanent evaluative principle or ideal, the essence of spirit nevertheless applies. Uh, in all of these instantiations or, uh, or instantiations, the immanent ideal of the constitutive relationship is, is reconciliation with constitutive otherness, whereby the otherness is not abolished by accommodated or domesticated in a way appropriate to, to the specific kind of relation and good for the relata. This, I suggest, is a general evaluative or critical framework in light of which Hegel inspired critical social philosophy should start thinking of the nature-spirit relation. Freedom is not something separating us from nature, something we, whereby we extract ourselves from it. Rather, on this axis of our constitutive relationality, it connects at, uh, us with nature in the right way. Call this realism about freedom, if you like. Turning now, finally, to the inner spiritual axis of constitutive uh, relationality, this brings us to the theme that has preoccupied much both Hegelian and non-Hegelian critical social and political thought in recent decades, uh, the theme of recognition. Much of that work has been in connection to issues of ethnic, cultural, sexual, and or other identity, a concern which I suggest is, is now, at least to some degree, giving way to more universalist concerns. What I'm interested uh, in is attitudes and relations of recognition as constitutive of us as human persons and of our social and institutional structures, or in other words, of the internally intertwined subjective and objective moments of our life form. As Hegel put it in one of his Jena uh, lectures, der Mensch ist anergenung, to continue in philosophical shorthand, which is to say, to condense numerous complex issues in one sentence only slightly longer than Hegel's, recognition is what distinguishes our life form from merely animal life forms. As I've argued elsewhere, recognition in this constitutive sense has in Hegel two dimensions, a, th a deontological one to do with authority and norms and such things, 
an, an axiological one to do with uh, immediacy transcending concerns and values, both structures of, of intentionality that distinguish human persons from simpler animals. Both, furthermore, are simultaneously, simultaneously ontologically constitutive phenomena and, gov and also governed by concrete freedom as their immanent ideal, an ideal which, so I want to suggest, is a sort of fundamental ethics of the life form. I will focus here only on the deontological dimension of, of recognition. Uh, the ontological side of this complex of issues has been in useful ways developed in recent American readings of Hegel by the influential work of Brandon, Pippin, uh, and Pinkard especially, and elaborated further by others, including Titus Stahl and myself. He had the basic idea of collective autonomy, which I have above discussed only in critical tone, is indeed sound and very illuminating. The thought is that where simpler animals are guided by natural instincts, we spiritual beings are governed by self-legislated norms. Institutions, we can say, are systems of norms that in imply deontic powers and deontic <coughs> roles, whether these be norms and roles in, say, linguistic communication or, say, the public institutions of a state. As human persons, we live in a world structured by collectively uh, legislated and authorized norms and norm systems and occupy in them various positions and role imbued with deontic powers, or in other words, rights and duties. How does recognition, recognition then figure in this onto the ontological uh, constitution of our life form? Here we need to distinguish between the vertical and the horizontal axis uh, of recognition idea, uh, kind of distinction idea originally introduced by Ludwig Sieb. As for the vertical axis, norms and thus institutions as systems of norms have objective social reality only insofar as they are, so to say, vertically upwards, recognized by the relevant individuals in the concrete sense of subjecting their life activities under them. Laws can be written in books, but they have social objectivity and thus exist as object spirit only insofar as they are in this way supported by the relevant persons or by subjective spirit, which thereby becomes governed by object spirit. The same goes for all social norms, including those governing a natural language and thus also linguistically structured thoughts. But this vertical axis of recognition is not the whole picture. Though norms only exist as social realities insofar as individuals lend them their authority by recognizing them in the, in the relevant sense, this authority also needs to have genuine otherness to, individual, to the individual. This is only the case insofar as it is authority of, the authority of other persons. This is to say, in short, that an individual is, is, is only a norm-governed being, and thus a person rather than a mere animal, insofar as she, uh, she horizontally recognizes some others as having authority on the relevant norms, whereby uh, his or her uh, life activities are then governed. We have here, <clears throat> I want to suggest the basic ingredients of the deontological dimension of what I call the fundamental ethics of the life form with regard to inner spiritual relations, now abstracted now from relations with nature. Namely, <clears throat> from the above, we can deduce a number of basic uh, roles which are more fundamental than the particular deontic roles we uh, uh, occupy within norm systems. First point, first of all, it is one thing to be only subject to norms, or in other words, recognize others as having uh, authority over one's life activities, roles, and so forth. It is another thing to be also recognized by others ha as having authority over norms and thus have uh, authority over norm norms governing one's life activities and or those of relevant others. Uh, a subject to norms and an authority of norms are both foundational roles uh, in this ontological basic structure, roles which Hegel illustrates with the memorable images of the bondsman and master. We do not even have to immediately specify which norms or norms of which kind we are talking about to see that this, generally speaking, is a role difference with fu fundamental significance. It is also not a matter of this or that culturally or historically specific normative order, but something that applies to all of them. Generally speaking, it is better to have at least some authority over or say on the norms whereby one's life and the lives of those one is dependent on is governed than it is to be mere subject to the norms. But whereas the betterness or superiority of the role uh, of an authority or that uh, of a mere uh, sub subject is merely prudential, there is another difference which uh, with a more straightforward moral or ethical significance. 
namely recognition of someone as uh, uh, having authority can be either conditional conditioned by the recognizer's prudential considerations such as say the master deliberating that is useful for him to recognize the slave or bond bondsman as having as having authority on issues important for the slave doing his work efficiently the master not having to be there to uh, to pick on every uh, every detail or then uh, recognition in the sense of uh, seeing the others or taking the other as an authority uh, can be unconditional not conditioned by prudential considerations this uh, latter is what I would call respect, and it is uh, uh, clearly the genuinely moral form of recognizing someone as authority. We can thus say that mutual respect between persons establishes normative orders that are generally moral orders. Again, again, this we can say without immediately at least specifying which norms or norms of which kind we are talking about. When it comes to norms that are very important for shared life, it is clearly better to be recognized by others as having authority over them in this unconditional or moral sense that is in the merely conditional or prudential sense. This betterness or superiority is not without prudential significance, but it is, it seems, nevertheless, superiorly of a distinctively moral or ethical kind. Now, analogical things could be said about the axiological dimension of the inner spiritual constitutive relations between persons, but I will uh, have to leave that here. I will finish with some uh, brief unsystematic remarks about the above. Firstly, <clears throat> for Hegel, recognitive relations in the above senses are specific axes of constitutive relations <clears throat> in which concrete freedom, the evaluative or normative essence of spirit, according to him, applies. In the self-conscious chapter, of the philosophy of subject spirit, and more exactly in the sub, sub, chapter, sub chapter universal self consciousness, mutual recognition is whereby subjects are conscious of themselves selves in each other as independent others, <clears throat> thus really realizing the unity of uh, unity and difference. This speculative unity is realized fully only, so I argue uh, in my forthcoming book and elsewhere, <clears throat> only by mutual unconditional recognition, since it's only. Uh, it is only thereby that sub first of all only thereby uh, that subjects do not reduce the authority of the other to their own personal considerations but recognize each other as genuinely other centers of authority and secondly so it is only thereby that they are immediately moved by the authority of others thereby bringing about a genuine unity Secondly, the authority as, as self-legislation is a fundamental distinguishing feature of our life form. This should not be understood in the abstract sense of something insulated from or spinning without friction from everything over which we have no legislative powers, in short, from nature. In the Hegelian framework, uh, record into relations cover only two of the axes of constitutive relations, namely the inner, the inner spiritual ones. And thus, they have to be seen in the complete context, including also the spirit nature relations. Any normative order we collectively legislate will be reviewed, so to say, by nature in terms of its sustainability or survivability. In other words, it cannot escape the principle of concrete freedom with regard to nature. Only normative orders or human societies governed by that, them that both acknowledge the otherness of nature, its independent dynamics, and are able to domesticate it sufficiently, which includes accommodating themselves to it, are sustainable or survivable. Uh, thirdly, and finally, uh, to return to the questions immanent to Hegel's system and how to utilize it, I have above tried uh, to do uh, something that in my view needs to be done if we want to utilize Hegel's ideas in contemporary critical social philosophy capable of addressing the most pressing concerns of our times and thus uh, being, if you want, our time comprehended in thoughts. Namely, we need to abstract from the time-bound uh, aspects of Hegel's philosophy and focus on, philo uh, on principles of higher levels of abstraction of, or universality. Only thereby can we develop Hegelian social philosophies capable of addressing not only this or that society or culture, but humanity at large, and thus creating conceptual means useful for addressing the most burning concerns of our times across cultural, religious, and other divides on a planet in which concerns and saliences are increasingly shared. My suggestion uh, is to do this by focusing on the concept of concrete freedom, but you might have other suggestions. And I'll end here, thanks.
Okay, thank you very much, Professor Itaimo. We have now room for questions. Ah, che non vedo però. Okay, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you, Professor Ikahemu, for the presentation. Very good one. Um, so I am very interested in hearing more about collective autonomy. Um, perhaps you can point me to um, aspects of ego that where that focuses on collective autonomy, where I can perhaps uh, do independent study on my own about collective autonomy. But it would be very helpful if you can elaborate a bit more about collective autonomy. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, one of the themes that is very difficult to find, kind of uh, say where exactly one should look in Hegel. I mean, it's kind of many of these themes are kind of all over the place and uh, recover quite a lot of reconstruction. It's more the uh, idea uh, uh, is uh, in the readings of Hegel, in the appropriations of Hegel's philosophy. Robert Brandom is uh, is very influential, uh, influential in this regard, and he has mainly uh, mainly uh, had in mind uh, semantic norms uh, and the, the basic idea of the kind of record in the constitution of the normative realm is articulated uh, by him there. But others have, uh, have uh, kind of, I think, broadly speaking, uh, had the same idea in mind that the other, Terry Pinkard, for instance, and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Robert Pippin, among the American readers, uh, so I would probably f start with Brandom. The problem there is, is that Brandom has his own program, which is very, very uh, ambitious and elaborate, and not the same one as as Hegel's. Uh, so, but anyway, it's the secondary readings that I would start from uh, rather than Hegel himself. And I'd be happy to talk with you, Abimbola, uh, later about this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Come closer. Okay. Um, thank you so much um, for your talk. Um, so I have a question, or I would like you to elaborate on the concept of concrete freedom, because as I understood it, um, I think it's that concrete freedom means that we can't understand the concept of freedom abstract or separated from nature, but we must somehow understand freedom as constitute all the constituted by nature or like developing out of like special structures something like this and i thought um and this is like the anti-kantian um stance within this concept uh, concrete freedom but then i thought maybe there so i was wondering if um the Hegel or the concept you developed is maybe not also still kantian in the sense that you stress the immanent ideal of recombination um, that is the synthesis um, for the concrete concept of freedom. And I was wondering what you, what kind of role would you attribute to the possibility of concept? Because I would say like in order to have maybe a concept, a concrete concept of freedom, then we must also have the possibility to, to be in conflict with each other. So it's not all about recombination, but also about conflict. And I was wondering, yeah, if you would agree with this, or where you would um, put the yeah the possibility of conflict in your conception of conflict freedom. Thank you. Right. Uh, I had a bit of difficulty hearing the details, but I think you were asking the role of conflict, if I was right, uh, in this framework of thinking about concrete freedom. Was that was that correct? Con conflict or conflict or conflictuality uh, i guess i mean th there's this there is this uh, common reading of what yeah according to which concrete freedom is a kind of total appropriation of the otherness uh, of the other whatever the uh, other might might be so that there is no room for otherness a kind of other otherness is uh, abolished so to say and that is the wrong uh, construal of this. I mean, the, the crucial idea is that otherness is abolished, otherness is maintained, uh, but uh, accommodated in a way in which it is not hostile. So how to, uh, how to apply this in, say, pol in political reality? 
now we come to the question of application. I mean, we've been talking about throughout the conference uh, of kind of um, Hegel's often about Hegel's particular application of uh, of a uh, of of kind of uh, conceptual forms, such as his application of certain conceptual forms uh, to uh, the gender relations, as he thought of them in his time time and place. The application is wonky in our view, of course. So uh, how that uh, notion applies to a particular relation. Well, we need to talk of what sort of particular relation we are talking about. Are we talking about political uh, conflicts, for instance? Uh, are we talking about interest conflicts, uh, for instance? I think uh, the concept applies there, but how it applies there, I and mean, it applies in useful ways in giving us some sort of normative or evaluative guidance, but how exactly uh, it applies there we we need to know more of the specific specificities but say uh, definitely uh, definitely uh, uh, i am a little bit allergic to the kind of uh, kind of hypostasizing the conflictuality as uh, as the kind of constitutive element of the political dimension of 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 our life form i want to see a room for genuine difference and therefore potential conflict but I also want to see that conflict as uh, kind of taking place within a framework in which, is that, in which it does not uh, uh, explode, so to say, to hostility, outright hostility. And I think that would be the way to start thinking about it. I mean, respecting the other, other's view as a potentially uh, meaningful view, uh, taking the other's concerns as having uh, weight and not merely weight in so far as it's in prudentially uh, important for me, but having weight in the same kind of ontologically constitutive sense as my or our concerns have in kind of setting up the uh, the axiological or evaluative uh, space uh, or aspect of our shared shared world. Those would be some of the ways in which I would start developing uh, developing this basic idea with regard to a particular potentially conflict to our relations. So again, saying something general is difficult. I think we should look at the uh, specificities of a particular case. Thank you. Luca? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, uh, yeah. Heike. Oh, I, 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 thank you, Heike, uh, for the presentation. Uh, I, I'm very sympathetic with your uh, idea of concrete freedom and of real so to say. Um, I'm not sure if we can close uh, Kantian philosophy into a pure constructivism, perhaps, but uh, uh, yeah, the, the problem here is legal. And what I'm interested to uh, is the relationship between uh, uh, spirit and nature okay? uh, that was uh, at, at the center of, of your presentation. And uh, uh, I wanted to ask you if, if we can uh, better understand this relation if we uh, think that nature and spirit are not two different uh, realms, two different, uh, so to say, substances or so on, but the spirit is uh, uh, life which uh understands itself so to say it, no? and so it is uh, uh, spirit in nature that understands itself that uh, uh, reflects on itself and if it is so uh, i think that uh, a problem that we have to to think is the is the problem of the exteriority of spirit, as of the naturalness of spirit in the sense that there is uh, always an exteriority into the spirit. Okay, thank you. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, definitely like that. <clears throat> I mean, uh, but there's something one-sided in the formulation that spirit is nature reflecting on itself or nature understanding itself uh, since it's that formulation alone seems not to leave uh, adequate room for for 
the difference or otherness aspect uh, of this relation. We, we can always say, we look at to our bodies, uh, as uh, philosophical anthropologists say, that we both are our bodies and we have our bodies. I think the same is true of the, the nature-spirit relation in general. I mean, one could say that spirit just is nature reflecting itself, but also one can say that spirit is related to nature as genuine, genuine otherness, and that the, the, the latter, <clears throat> that the uh, aspect of the relationship kind of commonsensically applies to a lot of concrete relations. I mean, our relation to uh, the fields out there or industrial farms uh, or, or what not, the kind of the aspects of nature that are have their own uh, own mind, so to say. We are not uh, fully in uh, in uh, in power over, etc. Uh, so, uh, what we said, I think, is generally true. But it's so uh, an aspect of uh, what we need to say about this relation that both uh, that is a as Hegel put it, unity of unity and difference. Very abstract thought of thought, uh, of course. Thank you. Okay, I have two questions on Zoom and then Chris. Uh, so Ricardo, then Eleonora, and then Chris. So Ricardo, go ahead. Mike. Thank you very much for your presentation, Heike. It was very interesting. Um, I was wondering, uh, in the same direction uh, that you mentioned, um, how we could actualize Hegel and the different um, attempts to, to actualize Hegel in this framework of recognition. And um, I think that um, Axel Hornet, as you show in many articles, uh, tries to uh, modify his concept of recognition uh, through an um, approximation to, to appropriation of um, a bigger debate in uh, analytical philosophy or this this uh, um, Anglo-Saxon regalians that you mentioned and this uh, problematization of uh, a concept of freedom connected with uh, a traditional conception of self-legislation. Self but uh, more than that, um, recently, um, he also um, tries to address a problem, um, um, like, like, like um, let me say like that, an, an, an injustice problem uh, derived from um, uh, a systematic failure of uh, the whole social order, and he uh, he um, will conceptualize this problem of the barbarization of the social conflict. That the social conflict is demoralized. Uh, the values are uh, that you can um, uh, identify in the social conflict are instrumentalized, and so uh, and then he introduces. Um, Another topic that I think that is very um, 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 very assessed today, a uh, regalian concept that is the concept of indignation and uh, And so, uh, how do you uh, think that uh, this concept has a a, a role in uh, rethinking the the paradigm of recognition do you think that this is another kind of struggle um, uh, and how um, do you connect this this new reading that uh, Honet uh, makes of Hegel through the concept of indignation in his his bigger part project I, I think that the, the question was too, too broad but uh, uh, yeah, I will be satisfied with if, of what mm -hmm. you could uh, answer mm -hmm. about that. Uh, thanks, thanks, Ricardo. I think there were many, 
many issues there. First of all, I have to say that uh, I do not actually think that uh, Hornet's thinking of the, the kind of deontological dimension of recognition is very much influenced by by the American uh, readers that I'm kind of drawing on here in, in kind of reconstructing the ontological uh, ontological side of things. Uh, he's uh, thinking of the deontological side of recognition as respect uh, uh, has a much more limited scope. Uh, he has in mind uh, the, the legal order of uh, modern societies and recognition in that. It's not a kind of ontological take of uh, the normative dimension of our life forms or social norms uh, in general, etc. But that's just an uh, issue about kind of side issue. Uh, now, with regard to the barbarous, barbarization of social conflict article, this, it's a while ago that I read that thing, but what uh, What's uh, happening there is that uh, kind of implicitly happening there is something that should have happened uh, earlier on uh, in in Honda's writing and, and elsewhere as well, namely realizing that uh, that uh, demands of recognition can be either moral demands or they can be prudential or instrumental demands. In the struggle for recognition, Honet just puts it there that demands for recognition are moral demands and kind of struggles for recognition are not strategic struggles, but they are moral struggles by definition. Now talking about the barbarization of social conflicts uh, and of, of people uh, demanding rights for prudential uh, reasons shows that, well, totally depends on what we mean by recognition and not all recognition is moral by nature not all demands of recognition are moral by nature therefore uh, kind of to keep things clear it is important to distinguish between the kind of the, the conditional uh, and unconditional or between the prudential and the moral that's just a kind of uh, uh, conceptual uh, observation of what's uh, going on there now I can't remember exactly what uh, Honet says there uh, about uh, about these issues. I think I mean the uh, the idea of indignation as such, uh, something like that is already in uh, in the kind of in Honet's according to Honet's uh, reconstruction of reading uh, in the Hegel and Jena, Hegel's Jena uh, Jena uh, text about crime etc. That crime can be a kind of kind of uh, uh, response to feelings of indignation etc. So that alone, uh, I don't think is, uh, is a new thing in, in Honnett's uh, writing. There will be, of course, much more to say, and I'll be happy to hear what more exactly you have in mind. I'm sure if this were, was very helpful. Thank you. Hey, Eleonora. Um, hello, uh, sorry, I, um, I'm not table uh, to start my video. I don't know why. <laughs> um, so, okay, I can now. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for, for your intervention. I would have many things to ask uh, to, to you, but uh, I will limit uh, uh, to one question again about recognition. So uh, you talk, if I got it correct understood about recognition as constitutive, uh, within a framework of a discourse on concrete freedom. Um, however, don't you think that talking about recognition as constitutive has the risk of overlapping a logic of recognition and concrete recognition as uh, a determination of concrete freedom? I ask this because the risk I'm talking about seems to me to be that of uh, considering recognition only from a sort of passive side of being recognized. Uh, whereas as you rightly uh, pointed out, recognition is such insofar as it is mutual. Uh, relation as constitutive, I understand and I totally agree, but doesn't recognition as constitutive run the risk of recognition passivity in your view? Mm. <clears throat> Recognitive relation uh, has a recognizer and a recognizee, so there's kind of active and passive side to it. Mutual, recog in mutual recognition, uh, both sides are both active and, and passive. I didn't say almost anything about the mutuality side uh, of things, but I mean, one-sidedness and mutuality is one of the kind of fundamental structural features uh, uh, of, uh, of recognitive relations that, that 
has some sort of ethical or moral significance, though that is just a very broad, broad, uh, broad observation. Um, I'm not quite sure why, why what I've said would imply or implicate some sort of kind of emphasis on passivity. I think both are important. We are both uh, kind of passively determined and actively determining ourselves and each other and uh, our life uh, activities and the norms, uh, norms, etc. Mm. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, I mean, just being a subject to norms, that's of course a kind of, uh, in a way, a passive role, uh, though it also consists of the activity of subjecting oneself under norms, whereas you could say that be having authority is more of an active role, and that, uh, I suggest, is a fundamental kind of role, a role difference. I'm not sure if that was addressed what you had in mind. Uh Yes, uh, thank you. I was told uh, about uh, the passage at the end of Science uh, uh, Doctrine uh, of Essence, uh, where uh, Hegel uh, speak about uh, uh, the um, so the uh, um, uh, the multiplicity and the one uh, could not uh, be um, so they have the necessity of being recognized. So uh, it seems something uh, constitutive. Uh, but uh, what uh, this logical aspect uh, uh, points out, uh, so this is my question. Um, I mean, it is, it is maybe uh, the risk it is that of a, just a passive uh, way to understand recognition instead of a, a mutual um, a mutual relationship so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, i'd be happy to hear more about the logical side of things but definitely i don't wanna want the picture be passive <laughs> only yeah. thanks thank you thank you christopher uh so thanks heike uh good to see you in italy again sort of um <laughs> Uh, I enjoyed the talk very much, and um, it's a really sophisticated and concrete view, which I like, but I have a hard time squaring the sophistication of it with the realism and the universality of it, right? So uh, I would want to press you along two sorts of dimensions, right? Um, one would be on the, the uh, picture that you've got here, constituted human relations, there's lots of those. And different kinds, and they interact with each other in various ways. And lots of the normative conflicts that we have have to do with balancing these different relationships that are involved in given institutions. Um, and then the other thing is, of course, I, I think it's just right to distinguish the deontological and the axiological dimension. Uh, in the philosophy of right, I would file those under the category of the right and the good and welfare. Um, yeah. But Hegel, I think, in his doctrine of the good, which is kind of sort of supposed to combine them, doesn't tell you very much about how it does so. He certainly has no interest in a kind of replacement for Kant's categorical imperative or anything like that. And it, it sort of seems to me that the way Hegel goes about doing that is to get rather particular and start talking about families and civil societies and states. And that looks like the direction that you don't really want to go. So, so I'm wondering if there's a way to pull back from that and maintain the, the universalism and the realism. Great, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those those are, are kind of <laughs> obvious further questions uh, in terms of which one needs to start then uh, elaborating on the framework. That the first, first question concerning the kind of multiplicity of the ways in which we are related, the kind of particular determination determinations of the, our relations to do with the particular roles that we occupy uh, in the social world as consisting of normative structures and our normative or deontic roles, the rights and duties, etc. These roles can, of course, be uh, in conflict with each, uh, with each, uh, each other. That's just I mean, uh, normative systems can be bad in that sense, or they're never perfect in that sense. I mean, people in particular roles often end up uh, in conflict with, with each other because of the, the requirements or, role, or rights and duties of these roles are in conflict, uh, conflict with, e with each other. That is sort of a, an objective conflict uh, there. 
Uh, and that's uh, that's hugely important. Of course, we really concretely want to understand our life uh, uh, lives in the social world as members of family, members of the civil society, state, and whatnot. Uh, nevertheless, behind all of that, I want to emphasize whatever uh, institutional reality, whatever society, whatever culture, whatever set of uh, or structure or system of social uh, roles. Uh, the life world in which we live consists of beneath, so to say, all of that is what I was talking about. And that's the, that's my point. <laughs> we need to get beneath those particularities or particular normative orders. And I didn't say this aloud, but I had in mind, uh, had in mind uh, the kind of development uh, towards which Honneth's work went uh, went after the uh, debate with Nancy Fraser and then in the book, uh, the, uh, the Freedom's Right, which draws uh, all of the, its normative resources from the given normative order. Uh, in Honda's case, that of basically Western Germany. And I, I think that is uh, Frankfurt School immanent, uh, the idea of Frankfurt School idea of immanent criticism gone all the way somewhere where it's not healthy to be anymore. I think we need to pull back from that concreteness and re really recede back to the more abstract level so that we can talk of any particular uh, social order, whether it is in Berlin or Port Moresby uh, or uh, outback Australia or Sydney, etc. cetera. Uh, but you're absolutely right. So, I mean, what I'm saying is in any uh, social system, there are these more fundamental roles than the particular uh, deontic roles uh, in the particular system. The more fundamental roles are those of someone subjected to the norms or and someone also having authority to the norms. So that's kind of the fundamental ethical or moral aspect that I want to talk about. After that comes all the all the kind of nitty gritty of the actual deontic roles in the deontic system on which we hopefully each of us have some authority, not just subjected. Uh, subjected to it, as Hegel's, uh, Hegel's uh, housewife basically uh, would have been subjected. Uh, now, the right and the good, and uh, that's absolutely right. Then, uh, when we start talking about this uh, more particular roles, then right and the good are, are, are <laughs> intertwined in many, many ways. And by distinguishing the deontological and the axiological dimension, I'm just kind of talking at the fundamental ontological level of kind of the fundamental constitutive intentionality. So the basic kind of constituents there that I have in mind is subjects as um, centers of authority and centers of concern. It's only these kind of subjects that we are potentially centers of authority on the norms by where our life is governed and concerns whereby our life world Receives, uh, receives this kind of axiological structure. Something is actually good or bad or seen as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as good or bad. There we can analytically and not just analytically, conceptually and ontologically distinguish between me as having authority and me as having concerns. Now in concrete life, those obviously need it to intertwine. I totally agree, agree with that. Good. Thank you very much. That was the last question, I believe. Thanks a lot to everyone.